Our second lesson is from the first book of Samuel, towards the very end of that book, chapter 30. It's the story of David, who has been leading a group of people. He hasn't become the king, but he's been ordained and promised that that would happen, anointed and promised that that would happen. So chapter 30 begins with these words, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and had attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they had taken captive the women and those who were from the smallest to the greatest. They did not kill anyone, but they carried them away and then they went on their way. So David and his men returned to the city and they saw that it was burnt with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David said to the people, who lifted up their voices and wept, and they wept. And he, left, he, he lifted his voice and wept with them until they had no more power to weep. Now David was greatly distressed. And the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people were so grieved every one for their sons and their daughters and their wives. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Amen. The final lesson comes from the work, the Arcana Celestia, or Heavenly Secrets, a portion of number 8,593. And this is going back to the story in Exodus, not reference to the Samuel story. Uh, Amalek came and attacked the children of Israel. These words signify a falsity that comes from interior evils. This is evident from the signification of Amalek as being falsities of interior evil, which is explained later on in the passage. It is first to be told who and what they are, who are in falsity from interior evil. Interior evils are those that hide inwardly, hide inwardly concealed within a person, hidden in their will, and therefore in their thoughts, no trace of which appears in their externals, as in their actions, or their speech, or their face. They who are in such evil study by every method and art to hide and hoard it under a semblance of what is honorable and just and under the semblance of love to the neighbor. Yet still, they devise nothing else within themselves than how they can inflict evil. And so far as they can, they do inflict evil by means of others taking care that it should not appear that it should be from themselves. They also color over everything that is evil itself, so that it may not seem like evil. The greatest delight of their life is to meditate such things, and to attempt them in concealment. This is what is called interior evil. They who are in this evil do not attack the truths of faith, but the goods of faith. And they act by means of depraved affections, whereby they pervert good thoughts, and this in the manner almost incomprehensible. These infernal genii never attack a person openly, nor when the person is capable of vigorous resistance, but when it appears that the person is falling, so as to yield they then suddenly are at hand and push them into a complete fall. This too is represented by the fact that the Amalekites now fell upon the people of Israel also afterwards when the sons of Israel had set themselves in opposition to Jehovah. The Amalekites then attacked. Here end our lessons from the word. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. It says, And David strengthened himself in the Lord. The Amalekites, sneaky bandits, 
An enemy that the children of Israel first encountered here in this story where they're leaving Egypt and they encounter these bandits throughout the stories of the word, the early stories where they're settling in the Holy Land. The Amalekites, their name comes from the dwellers who are in the valley. Amalekites, as read in the Arcana, stand for a kind of evil in our own lives. Of course, all the landscape of the Holy Land, all the stories of the Word are of the landscape of our own minds and of the journey that we are taking from the kind of slavery represented by living in Egypt to the kind of life promised in the Holy Land. Sadly, and yet truly, life is a series of struggles, isn't it? With ourselves, with people around us as well, but Really, our true victory comes from the Lord within the struggles that we experience with our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own sense of right and wrong, our own interactions and best behavior as we choose what to say and do as we are dealing with the people around us, the problems at hand. The Malachites stand for that ability that evil spirits give us to take and twist good things and really slaughter what is vulnerable. It slaughters what's vulnerable within ourselves, but also with other people. And as I said in that passage from the Arcana, that, that rarely do what is represented by the Amalekites, when we're operating with that Amalekite spirit, rarely do we openly, we don't openly say anything bad or false or untrue. But we can inspire other people. This is especially true when it comes to gossip and bullying. Whenever we're talking about other people, we can so easily twist say we're concerned about them, let's talk about it, to actually say things that don't support and hold up others, but actually allow them to uh, be heavily un influenced by the weight of the inference that we can make about what's going on in somebody else's life. The worst thing about the Amalekites, spiritually speaking, is that they speak to us in our own voice. How sneaky. How easily we're convinced when a thought pops into our head. We think, oh, well, I hadn't thought that before. That seems like a good idea. It might have its it's problems, but yeah, yeah. Well, they might not like it, but yeah. The Amalekites talk to us, as I say, in their own voice. The battle that we're facing as a society, as a culture, the world, um, has some really close analogies to the battle with the Amalekites. We're, we're facing an invisible enemy with fighting the disease, this pandemic, coronavirus. And it can wear on us and, and weaken our resolve. It can, it can weaken our ability to stay positive. It can discourage us because things just, we just want them to get better faster and more clearly. And within this kind of environment, and it's not anything new, people will start saying, well, you know, it's not that bad. People are just making up false numbers about how bad things are. Or, you know, vaccines are being put out by people that want to do such evil. And, you know, we hear all kinds of ideas, and we have to process them all. We have to make the decision ourselves about what we will do ourselves to be as healthy as possible. When or if we'll get a vaccine ourselves, we have to make that choice. Vaccinations have a long history of controversy in the new church. You go back to the volumes of New Church Life, the publication described in articles various concepts related to church doctrine or whatever, it's a, you know, what a magazine does. And you'll find the volumes get thicker and thicker on the shelves when controversial things like vaccine or the nature of wine. People have all kinds of ideas they want to share back and forth. 
But the Amalekites love to come in and start having you see a conspiracy over here with these people because they're evil. And all they want is to enslave you. Go back to the second lesson about the Amalekites that brought to us in the book of Samuel. David didn't do anything wrong. He and the rest of his men were doing what they were doing as David was waiting to be anointed and crowned king. They were making a living. They're off doing what they were doing. And the Amalekites come in, burn their houses, capture their wives and their children. Everybody is crying until they had no strength left to cry anymore. Have you ever had a day like that? Or maybe a week where things have gone so bad, you're so sad, you just there's no more tears left. These things happen in our lives. So in the, the midst of such deep grief, not only had they been attacked by the Amalekites externally, but here we see the attack of the Amalekites interiorly. It said they wanted to stone David. Must be his fault. He's our leader. He let this happen. Let's kill him. That'll solve it. Now, does that sound like a familiar pattern? It's a very familiar pa pattern. It's so familiar that uh, the Lord set up a whole, a whole ritual related to taking blame and putting it somewhere and then getting rid of it. It's called the ritual of the scapegoat. We use that phrase that, did you know it's out of the word? That they would have a scapegoat. They'd have a goat and they would ritualistically place their problems and their sins upon this goat, send it out, and sacrifice it. Instead of killing a person. Much better idea. And that's why the sacrifices that were instituted among those people were of animals, not great, but better than killing people. Better than sacrificing your own children, which was one of the spiritual practices among the people that are called the worshippers of Moloch. They had no more power to weep. They did recover their wives, their children, sons and daughters. But in the middle of it, what what does that energy want to do? What does the energy of the Amalekites when we're attacked by them, what does it do to us? We want to attack somebody else. And this was open, yes. But the Amalekites work within our minds to, to make us think that this is a good idea secretly. They operate that way. We come up with this, this sense of righteous indignation. We have, we have the obligation to punish someone else. It's, it's we have to do it. And it's true that there are uses to punishments and consequences. But the Amalekites love to find some, some good thing, some good idea, and then twist it so that we end up doing what's really hurtful to somebody else. And, and we get a little bit of pleasure out of it. Well, there we go. Righteous indignation, it's called. We nurse resentments. And then we act them out. It said, David strengthened himself in the Lord. As Moses did when he was constantly attacked by the children of Israel, things went wrong. Did you bring us out now to starve and die of thirst in the wilderness? That was one of many times the children of Israel complained to Moses the beginning of the story of the Amalekites attacking they wanted water. Moses took his rod, struck the rock, and water came out. But they're ready to stone Moses. They're ready to kill David. We're ready to, to find almost anything to throttle our leaders because if it could get better, it's because they've been holding us back. If things go bad, it's because they let us into what's wrong. If there's a problem... It's probably because somebody else brought this upon us. Because the Lord doesn't operate that way, so it must be somebody else's fault. It 
Amalek sneaks into the back of our minds, sneaks into the feelings that we have of the need for security, sneaks into the feelings we have of, of fear or resentment, and then provides us with some ways to take care of these things, but to do it in such a way that we don't come off looking bad. We, we work other people. We work the crowd. We work the room. We work a couple of friendships. We see or feel or sense the strife between two other people and, and work into that. And then they fight. That's the Amalekites, spiritually speaking. I want to read a, a section from a book. It's called Return to the Promised Land by the Reverend Grant Schnarr. And he goes through, as you can find, so many good series related to this process of leaving Egypt, coming to the Promised Land. And uh, Reverend Schnarr talks about the Amalekites in a, in a way that is refreshingly honest. He speaks at first about his own concern and his fears about, about flying. And he, he uses the analogy of the ideas that sneak into his mind as he's sitting in the plane seat and the Amalekites attack with, you're going to die. You know, you're in the same DC-10 plane that crashed not that long ago. And as you take off and you look out the window, and it lost a, a jet engine. And <laughs> Grant describes, he knows he doesn't need to look out the window, but there he is, finding himself staring out the window because his fears have now been brought to the fore. And the Amalekites, great analogy, have, have just led him to a great sense of terror. I'd like to read a little section from page 106 and 107 of this book. Usually after we'd level off in the plane, I'd relax. Once, however, after leveling off, I heard a noise that sounded like a crack in the fuselage. Before the, Amalek, the Amalekite could speak, I tightened my seatbelt. He's talking about like a cartoon character on his shoulder, the Amalekite. I tightened my seatbelt. I thought, well... Even if a hole does blow open this plane, I'm safe because I have my seatbelt tightened. But that was before the accident over the Pacific in which several passengers were sucked out of the hole in their chairs. Chairs and all. The Amalekites reminded me of that story every time I heard a strange sound in the wall beside me. They told me whatever would work to bring up my fears, if they could, They'd have had me dashing in mid-flight up the corridor, cracking, knocking on the cockpit, screaming, open the door, I'm getting off the plane. And the Amalekites can even lead us to harm ourselves. They often show up when we suffer from guilt, for instance. They introduce themselves as very caring friends. But then gradually they twist their words and fill us with self-doubt and condemnation. They say, gee, I guess you feel pretty bad about what just happened there, don't you? Well, do you really think that you could help it? What you just did that hurt somebody? These things happen from time to time with most people, don't they? Well, maybe they don't, the Amalekite says. Maybe you're different, the Amalekite tells you. I guess most people aren't capable of acting like such a monster as you are. You probably don't even feel like a human being, do you? You're lower than a human being, aren't you? You don't deserve anything, do you? You don't deserve to feel good or happy. You really don't deserve to live. In fact, why don't you just kill yourself? It would be one way to rid the world of people like you before they can do more damage. These Amalekites will continue as long as they can. In fact, if they can, they will take your very life. If not literally, then figuratively, making you more and more miserable and unable to cope with normal pressures. What a great description of entering into with the great support, not positive, but negative 
support of what is represented by the Amalekites in the Word as the heavenly doctrines describe this secret interior evil that doesn't operate openly. These thoughts are coming to your own head and they are in your own voice. So, final paragraph I'd like to read from page 108 of Return to the Promised Land. Destructive thoughts come into play in all phases of life. They are the little voices within, the cartoon devils on the shoulder, the Amalekites speaking up at the back sneaking up at the back of the procession to take us and lead us astray. They are the voices of fear, anger, jealousy, contempt, self-pity, guilt, lust, greed. The Amalekites are the thoughts that show up when we are down to bring us to the ground, to rob us of the good that we did possess, to kill our joy and delight, to leave us barren, wasted, and half dead. They will continue to ambush us every time we forget that they are present. Unless we act immediately, we must stop these thoughts, confront them once and for all, and do battle against them. We must fight these Amalekites with what weapons we can find from the divine to work yet another miracle to help us rid, be rid of these detestable malefactors. So, of course, in the literal sense of the story, the Amalekites are doing their destruction. Moses is the inspiration from the Lord, the law that comes by means of the word. And Joshua is down in the valley fighting the people of the valley. And Joshua stands for these fighting truths that we have. The Lord gives us the fighting truths. And we're hopefully having them speak to us in the, our own voice as well. It's the support that we see up on the hill with Moses and his hands are raised and he's being supported, but we feel it in our hearts as the Lord. And so often people can focus on the Lord and they think about the Lord's own sacrifices and if the Lord could do it, we can do it. People think about the fact the Lord died for my sins. And that's an inspiration to think somebody else suffered much worse than I did and they overcame by their faith in the Lord. It says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. When the Amalekites attack, we do have to turn and think, what do I know from the Lord's word that can fight against this idea that I'm worthless or this is so too hard for me to handle or there's no reason to try to even be happy. Things are too depressing. One of the best thoughts that can come to us is the thought of this image of Moses having his hands held up by two friends. Call somebody. Don't say, well, if they loved me, they'd call me. If they were really my friend, they should have called me to check in to see how I'm doing. That's the Amalekites working their best scheme. It's somebody else's fault. You're not feeling well. Blame it on them that they didn't call you to find out how you're doing. Don't listen to the Amalekites. You call them and say, hey, how are you doing? I've been thinking about this or that. What's going on with you? Come to this session after church service today. Check in. It's so easy at times like this for us to look around, blame Moses, blame the Lord, blame David, blame your mother, blame your children. Well, and don't blame yourself either. These are hard times. We struggle. And in one sense, this isn't any different from any other time. It's just the circumstances have changed. We all will have that struggle within. To recognize the Lord's gift of life is His to us, our response is going to be fraught with struggles. The Amalekites needed to be wiped out and they kept not getting wiped out. Children of Israel were told, blot out the Amalekites. The first job, the first king got, Sam, or Saul was told, the Amalekites are going to attack, attack you. Take them, wipe them out. Utterly blot them out from the existence of the earth. It sounds really harsh and cruel, but think of it spiritually first. 
We need to utterly block, block out, or utterly destroy these little teeny thoughts as they come to develop in our minds. And Saul said, hmm, I think I'll keep the king and some of the best livestock. Yeah. The Lord probably doesn't know what he's talking about because why waste all, all these? I can get a ransom for the king and my people will be happy if I give them. Samuel came. Very powerful story. Samuel said, what's this bleeding in my ears? What? You were told to utterly destroy the Amalekites. And instead he beheaded King Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And then those words are spoken. We often think about to obey is better than to sacrifice. To hearken is much more valuable than thousands of rams. Obeying. The Amalekites love to sneak in, give you that feeling like you can kind of probably twist, probably adapt the word to actually not say what's so difficult. Because who has to live that in such difficult things? No. You need to transfer some of the difficulty to somebody else. David strengthened himself in the Lord. We need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. We need to rely upon the support we can receive. We need to take the steps to get support when we need it. Don't listen to the Amalekites saying, nobody else is doing this, calling other people. Why should you? No, when you need help, get help. Good thing Moses didn't say, get away from me. I can do this. I can handle this. His people would have lost. He needed support. It's good for us to say to our friends, I need to reach out to you. I need your support. It's good for us to say to our friends, I'd like to reach out to you to give you support. David strengthened himself in the Lord. We need to strengthen ourselves with the fighting truth that says the Lord's kingdom is a kingdom of useful service. I can be useful by talking to somebody else. I can be useful by actually letting somebody else talk to me. The Amalekites were utterly blotted out in the story, in the series with, within this section of the Old Testament. We ourselves have to work constantly to keep those thoughts at bay, to wipe them out as they first begin, especially depressing thoughts, and to get help, to get help, to think about the story of Moses, making sure he got support. He sat down. Sometimes you just got to take a seat and get help. Amen.